Hello all. Today we're lucky to be joined by Mr. Benjamin Salinas, a graduate student at Brown University. Um, ben graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from Cornell, where he was a Mellon's Mays undergraduate fellow. His interests are in indigenous language hip hop and popular music, social media and music technologies, and the histories of the indigenous people in Mexico. Outside of school, he's a musician and enjoys taking care of plants. So I recommend everyone after this webinar to take a look at his works. And um, if you have any difficulties finding them, just reach out to me and I'll share along what I have. Um, and without further ado, Mr. Salinas, take this um, away. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, Emmeline, and everyone that has put this together. I'm, I'm honored to be, to be speaking here with you today. I'm just going to go ahead and start this presentation. I'm going to be talking today about something called rap originario, um, which is a which translates to originary rap, and this is a a form of indigenous language hip hop. It's also an activist movement where indigenous peoples rap in their rap in their language in order to try to get more people to speak it and to challenge problematic notions of indigenous identity. And so, just right off the bat, I think it's important that we just play a little music. <laughs> Oh, you're muted right now. So that was just a brief little example. Sorry about the muting, classic Zoom problem. Um, that was just a brief example. We're going to get back to a lot more music today. But that was Pat Boy Maya Rap. Uh, that you can see him right here in this top right corner. He is from Felipe Carrillo Puerto in the Yucatan Peninsula of, of Mexico, and he speaks Yucatec Maya. The other two people who are really informing my work today are Zara Mandroy, who is from the Seri Comcac Nation uh, up here in the top left uh, in the Chuecas, Puente Chueca Sonora, and she speaks Kamiki Itomi. She says that she is a translator, a singer, a dancer, a model, a fisher. Um, she just has a whole list of her different occupations. So she's, she's a really fabulous woman. Um, and the third person is Juneva. Juneva is the word, is translates to house of wind in, um, in his language, which is the Baku or Cuicateco. And he is from Santa Maria Popolo, which is in the center of the country in a state called Oaxaca. So I chose these three artists because they are they kind of represent the diverse experiences of being indigenous, not only in the world, but specifically in Mexico. So in each different kind of state and each different community, the, the relationship between the indigenous community and the state, the government is, is, is different because of the, you know, the different needs of each community. So I chose these three to try to highlight how diverse the experience of being indigenous is. So just to kind of give you a little bit of background, right? This is a quote from Pat Boy. He said, for me, it's very important to rap in Maya because I feel that it is something that I can transmit to the youth and non-youth as well. Um, I feel that because they don't know what culture is, they don't know where they are from, where the Maya come from, what they have made, what they have constructed. If you feed yourself with all this information, I feel that they will be proud of where they come from. And so this is kind of the really the main thing that rap originario, originary rap, is trying to do is trying to erase that shame. Now, this shame is a historical thing. It's it's created over centuries and centuries of colonization and imperialism. Um, so, you know, it starts with the, the the category of Indio or Indian, which uh, was the misnomer from Christopher Columbus, who thought he landed in India. Um, and throughout kind of the hundred years, several hundred years of history of of, of Spanish colonial rule indigenous peoples were discriminated against. They couldn't speak their language, they couldn't practice their traditions, their religious traditions, couldn't wear their own uh, garments and vestments, and so on. Um, and then throughout the 20th century, indigenous identity was, was created a bit differently, but still uh, shamed and shunned in a certain way. So academics would talk about indigenous peoples being much closer to nature and they're, they're more natural and primitive type of people and need to preserve that kind of thing so that all of humanity can be, can be aware of it. Um, so indigenous peoples were kind of 
seen as being left in the past. They can't really move forward. They don't have new practices or anything like that. Um, and today, this seems to be changing. The Mexican state is having a lot more events that feature indigenous artists and more indigenous people are involved in the government. But nonetheless, this is all kind of seems like more of a performance and like the actual on the ground experience of being indigenous often is one of facing discrimination, of facing lack of access to resources, um, and especially during the coronavirus, lack of access to, you know, the personal protective equipment and, and other things. So this hasn't been a complete story of domination. Indigenous people have resisted since the very first moments of colonization. Um, but in Mexico, there have been many disagreements about how indigenous resistance should look. And this has uh, limited the effectiveness of some of the policies and actions that they have taken. So for example, there's some groups that want to focus more on the inclusion in electoral and national politics. So getting more indigenous peoples into government positions so they can influence the policy that will, you know, that, that the government puts out. Some people focus more on advocating to bring resources into their communities uh, from both the government and from non-governmental non organizations. And some are more for rejecting the state completely and having that be, you know, just not part of who they are. Um, so all of these different things have their own positives and negatives, um, right? If you're too local, right? If, so for example, a language program. If you are teaching a language program in a community, you're for one, only reaching people in your community. And two, if the children are not wanting to learn an indigenous language, if everything else in their life is telling them that speaking an indigenous language is, is a shameful thing, they're not gonna learn whether the program is there or not. On the other side, if you're only going for national politics and state inclusion, it's really easy for your message to be co-opted and for the state to be like, look, we're celebrating indigenous peoples, we're celebrating culture, we're celebrating all these things, but to completely ignore the actual conditions of indigenous people. For example, in the north of Mexico, there's always been a, um, since like the 1960s or 70s, I believe, there's been a policy where Mexico has actually sold water to the United States from the Sonoran Desert, from like the most arid place, which experiences the worst droughts. Um, and often it's indigenous people who so have to walk for miles to go and get potable water. And so these are the kinds of things that while the government may say, look, we are supporting indigenous peoples, they're, they're really not. Now, this seems like a kind of a grim picture to paint, but um, what is really interesting about hip hop is that it seems to be able to speak to all of these different needs. And so this is just an example. Pat Boy Maya Rap, who you saw in that first video, is actually, he's a rapper, but he hosts language learning programs in his community. He hosts language learning programs online on Zoom for anybody to learn. And he also performs at various local state national events that um, are put on by what's called the Secretariat of Culture, basically a government organization designed at increasing the, the visibility of indigenous peoples. So hip hop is this really, really interesting thing. And we all like, everyone knows about hip hop. And that's one of the really important things is that it's this global cultural phenomena. So these are these, uh, these scholars called Semi Alim, Awad Ibrahim and Alistair Pennycook, all scholars of hip hop as well as language, describe hip hop as an array of cultural practices and a lifestyle. So it's more than just, you know, songs and, and, and dancing, right? So if you can be rapping, DJing, break dancing, graffiti, fashion is involved, um, the music videos are involved, people and your community, your little, your hip hop posse as they call it is, is hugely important. And most importantly is, is this idea of knowledge, some kind of, um, some kind of knowledge that is oppositional to the state. So in when hip hop first started in the 1970s in the Bronx, this meant countering a lot of the the, the city's policies that force, you know, African American and brown people in, to, to live in certain parts of the cities without access to resources. Um, for indigenous peoples, this is being applied to, as I was talking about, countering the shame of speaking an indigenous language and practicing your indigenous traditions. So it can be adapted to different circumstances all over the world. There's hip hop, I don't say literally everywhere, but like it seems like there is hip hop everywhere. Um, and you can, what's in, 
interesting is that you can always recognize it as hip hop, but it always conforms to the local, the local uh, circumstances. So for example, you know, you can rap in whatever language, you can put any kind of instrumentals and beats underneath that represent your local experience. You can change dancing and graffiti to be more dances or art forms that are, that are pertinent to your culture. Um, fashion, of course, too, and knowledge. And knowledge is, like, again, a very local thing, but we can still recognize it as hip hop. And so this kind of gets at that tension that indigenous people feel where they want to be both expressing their specific traditions and specific ideas about what it means to be indigenous, but also joining in a larger conversation about indigeneity, say in Mexico, um, and to have solidarity across different indigenous communities, because that is a really powerful thing in activism. One person can't make a huge change, but hundreds and hundreds of people together um, can really affect something. And so hip hop has been used to self fashion identity. Basically, in this case, we're changing identity from being this shameful thing to being, you know, something that you should be proud of and should be practiced. Um, it can be used for protesting, and this is true in hip hop's um, indigenous language hip hop's in South America, especially, especially in what's called rap mapuche, which is mainly in Chile and Argentina. And these two, these are often hip hops where people use hip hop as an organizing factor to, you know, organize protests and protest the government. Um, and it can also be used for education, as I showed with Papo and Maya rap. So now I'm just going to go through a few examples of what I, of uh, how I came to these these ideas. Um, and the first example we're going to start with is a guy named Juniva. His song called Mi Lengua, which is my language or my tongue, literally. And these are a few lyrics that are important, right? So he says, I speak the language of my grandparents, ancestors. They taught me I don't want Kukateko to finish. Um, they don't speak, the, the youngins don't speak Kukateko well. That's how things go today. It could be that Kukateko becomes extinct. So you can see in all of these lyrics here that there is a real worry for his language disappearing because no one wants to speak it anymore. Because of that shame that people feel they're not speaking their indigenous languages and indigenous languages are more than just all languages in general are more than just words and like their meanings. It's a connection to a community, right? We only know, we can only understand each other because we all have an, a communal understanding of, of language. Um, and so when a language dies, when a language is lost, you lose that connection to a whole history of people and a whole way of seeing the world um, that gets erased when you lose a language. And so I'm going to show a bit of this video just to highlight that. So that's a brief example of that. You can check it, all of his stuff out on YouTube and uh, on Spotify, I believe. Juneva also has a podcast where he talks about kind of different issues for indigenous peoples. And he interviews both like musicians and activists, scholars, people who work in agriculture and ecology. So go and check him out um, and all of his stuff. 
Now, one thing that's actually pretty important about this video um, is that it shows community and community is hugely important to, to indigenous peoples, right? Where you come from and the people you come from. And as I was talking about earlier with language, connection to people through being able to speak a certain language is one of the ways that indigenous experiences are, um, are manifested. And so when you show a video of you know the children in your community, the elders in your community, and you're talking about how people don't want to learn Kukateko, the the words change. It gives it a new meaning, and you can really see that this isn't just some abstract idea, but a really lived experience um, and a very specific lived experience. This is his hometown. These are the people that he grew up with, um, and he's rapping about what's important to him. Now the next person I'm going to talk about is Pat Boy, and this is a song called Vidas Mayas. So Vidas Mayas translates to Mayan lives, um, and so this song is talking about just basically what it means for him to be to be Maya. So he has lyrics that say, everyone carrying water jugs to the milpa, which is a basically farm. The man carries the axe and the machete with his belt. They are tools that represent work, people that love the earth and nobody dominates them. Farmers that were born being Mexicans, proudly Maya, Maya fighting for each peso, living in the lands, caring for the ejido, another word for a farm, uh, cultivating their work that is the fruit of their efforts. So here you can really see that one of the, one of the stigmas against indigenous people is that they're lazy. Um, another stigma is that they only work on farms and in agriculture and in and in the hierarchy of what jobs are considered best, like farmers and agriculture often gets put towards the bottom. And so this is really trying to undo that and show, yes, we, you know, we farm and we create food and this is something that's vitally important for us. And if you look into all of the information about um, indigenous peoples in Mexico, the, the relationship with, with what you grow and what you eat is, is extremely important. Um, and so this is a really interesting song too, because well, it was, first of all, it was Pat Boy's first song that he wrote in Yucatec Maya, and this was in 2009. But then in 2013, I believe, um, this government program called Canal 22, or Channel 22, which is funded by the government, uh, created a documentary on him uh, about an hour, about 30 minutes long, which you can find on YouTube as well. Um, and he rewrote the song. So here, hip hop is a way for him to like talk about and challenge the problematic notions of being indigenous that are actually created by the state while simultaneously being uplifted by the state. Um, and so this is one way that I think that change is happening, right, on that national level and like talking about what it means to be indigenous. He's, he's really changing that. Um, while at the same time, he's able to host different language events because of the popularity he's gained from being a hip hop artist. And you can see now that that hip hop is able to operate at all those different levels I was talking about, both the national and kind of the more local, and even the international. Papua Mayorap has actually worked with artists from Colombia and from all over Mexico as well. And so there's a real ability that hip hop allows for, for activism at many different levels. I'm gonna show you another a short clip of this video. I think it's really important to, share, to show the music too and hear, and hear the language. And so this is the video for Vidas Mayas. Yeah, sí. Este es Custal Mayao. Vidas Mayas. Este el sureste mexicano. Ya tú sabes. Este es Patuay. Ya. Pexe Captech de lo. Bisu Yali. Se coló me ya, de ti de maya boa, curta el lote, no la quinto, no caje el México, te chico vesco cash up, me le caí de calla, me tenés sin a león, que que el chival ya te, y se coló me ya, de ti de maya boa, curta el lote, no la quinto, no caje el México, te chico vesco cash up, me le caí de calla, me tenés sin a león, que que el chival ya te, mucha pa es con escate la glilles, le pasa macho que le, si te nenes, no cucho y ni quiete pa la winik, que me cucho lo pjo cano que wik, so again, you can see the community, the people, these, these are his family members that he's showing, his family members and friends. You can see that people are working as taxi drivers. You can see in this video people wearing what would be considered more Western style clothing, 
but you can also in later in the video you see people wearing huipils, which is a, a traditional um, vestment for for women. Um, and so in this video, you see kind of the diverse experience even of being indigenous in a particular place, right? You can wear jeans and a polo and still be indigenous, or you can wear what's considered like a traditional garment. Um, and that's also important. But the, the, the important part of this whole video is to show that there's that much diversity and uh, within an indigenous experience. And so the last thing I will talk about in the last few minutes I have is Zara Monroy. This is, um, I'm going to talk about a song called Toda la Buena Vibracion, which translates to all, all of the good vibrations, basically. Um, but she does never provides, she almost never provides lyrics for her songs. So in one of her other videos, she said that she, there was a, uh, an ancestral SETI song of the Kunkak Nation, um, in that there is not a translation, only that you feel the vibration of the song and let it guide your heart. And so she really challenges what it means to listen to music, at least in my eyes. Um, often we listen to the lyrics and go to the definitions and say, okay, what is this? What are these lyrics saying? But you can't, you can't do that with this because unless you know um, Itomi, unless you know the language. And so Zara has still been able to find success regard, regardless of this because the idea of an indigenous language has its own meaning. Hearing someone speak a language that you don't know has a, has a different feeling than speak, hearing someone speak a language that you do know. And so sometimes in indigenous communities, they don't want to give up all of the information about who they are in their, you know, if, if it's an ancestral song that may be super important to them and super, super important for them to keep to themselves, but they still want to people to know about their issues, about their experience and about what needs to change for indigenous peoples. And so this is an interesting balance between those things. So I'm just going to show this the last video clip here for Toda la Buena Vibración. Ya me perdí cuál sigue. <laughs> la que sigue se llama Coquipia, uh, que significa Toda la Buena Vibración. Y Toda la Buena Vibración, así se llama. un poco de rap porque ahí en la comunidad los chicos les gusta mucho el ritmo rap o hip hop también un poco de rock también les gusta. So there she just said that it's important to rap and do other western genres of music because that's what kids are interested in hearing. So she puts those genres into her own language as a way to get people to and so that's another example right you can't you we don't know the lyrics but she explained a bit about where she's from uh i've watched there's a whole video of this entire concert and she she talks about where she's from and what's important to her um and one of the things that she says she raps a lot about is la madre tierra mother nature um the earth and so she has a slideshow in the background of Puente Chueca, where she's from, um, showing you know the water where she fishes in, the lands that she lives in. Um, and for indigenous peoples, there's often, as I was saying, there's often a deep and almost spiritual connection with the land and with natural things. And so this really changes the performance. If it was just her rapping and you only heard the language, you, you, it would be, it's an entirely different experience than hearing the language and seeing the video along with it. And so this context gives more specificity to indigenous peoples that they're not just this complete and total thing that there's an indigenous experience that you can see, but there are many different experiences and hip hop is a way for Zara and all these other artists to express that. And so that is the end of Oops, if I can get on here. These are just some conclusions that I wrote, um, wrote up, basically that hip hop can be used in a number of different communities. And as such, it's really good for activism because you can talk at kind of local levels and national and international levels. 
And even if it's not the only answer, it shows us how things like identity and things like culture are constructed as ideas and not real, like given natural things that are in the world. Um, and if those are constructed by powers like the state for oppression, then they can be reconstructed by people, indigenous peoples for liberation and activism. So thank you all for being here. Um, these are the Instagram pages of the people and I will put them in the chat as well so that people can find them. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually Calvin Watching also has a lot of questions so we can just delve into what happened. So I guess the first thing that I noticed was with the songs that you're playing towards the end, um, I noticed that there's like different amounts of, I guess, like Spanish being used in the music. Um, and just from like your perspective, how do you analyze the significance of, I guess, incorporating Spanish into their songs when they're also like trying to like foreground indigenous languages? Yeah, and that, that's an extremely important thing. So one of the things I would say is that at least for these artists, they're not trying to like demonize Spanish. Spanish is not necessarily the enemy. What is the problem is that Spanish has been kind of the dominant language, has been the language that should be spoken um, in the eyes of the state. And so, so there's that part of it, but including Spanish is also really important because as I was saying, you know, most people don't speak these languages and to include Spanish is to open up your message to other people, even if it's even if you are, you know, like foregrounding indigenous languages. And as you saw with like the Pat Boy song and the Yuneva song, they actually have the translation of either Cuicateco or Yucatec Maya. They have the Spanish translations in the video so that people can like watch along and read alongside it. Um, and so it's this way of forming this international solidarity, right? Um, Pat Boy also like has viewer, all of them have viewers from all over the world. Pat Boy has had like a number of like concerts with like, that are sponsored by people in Germany or Australia or, or Chile. So there's a way that Spanish allows indigenous peoples to get their message into broader discourses while still highlighting the indigenous language. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I guess like on that note also, um, I know that like in your body, you talked about how you're a musician. So is that maybe like how you got into like this field of interest or was it more like reverse, like you were interested in like indigenous like activism, found music and then got interested in like music as a passion or um, yeah, like how did that go around? Yeah, so I, I've, been, I've been doing music my whole life. Music has always been a way for me to connect with other people, connect with how I feel. Um, I am very removed from, I mean, I'm, my, my family comes from Mexico, which is why I kind of started studying this. Um, but I don't really have much connection to it. You know, my family was forced to, I, I didn't even grow up speaking Spanish. Um, I've had to learn that. So for me, music was always a way to connect with, connect with my heritage, the things that I was, that have been erased because of colonialism and because of imperialism. And so music, is, for me, before I started studying music was, was that kind of connection. And so it, I see research as a way to just expand my knowledge about the world and to understand how things are happening and to just grow my mind. Um, and so it seemed like the best possible route, right? To do the thing that speaks to me the best. Um, and also it's a collaborative experience and so much in research on indigenous peoples has been like some white dude going in and being like, oh, these are great ideas. I'm gonna take them and I'm gonna write about indigenous people and now, this knowledge has like almost become mine. Like I've made it mine because I am the author of this book and I am the expert on indigenous peoples in, in whatever country. Um, but music is a different kind of research experience, right? Like, so what I'm trying to do in the future, what I'm working on right now is, uh, is like producing beats for hip hop artists as a way to, because often you have to pay for them or you have to like get licensing fees. And so one way of like standing with indigenous peoples while doing research with them as well is to support the projects that they're doing. Um, and as a musician, that, that seems like one of the ways that I can both do research, understand the world a bit better, understand myself a bit better, but not make it such a 
extractive process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that idea of like someone who's not indigenous, I guess, like taking responsibility or like credit for like the work. How do you think that, um, like, even if it's like, maybe we should talk with like students, like how can they engage ethically um, while like, I guess, not impeding upon like the culture like you were talking about? Yeah, I, it's, I mean, it's tricky, right? It, it's always tricky and there's no one answer because every different community has their own has their own kind of sets of what they want to share with the world and what they don't. Um, this is definitely more clear in like the United States. I feel like I've seen a lot more indigenous communities in the United States unwilling to share stuff about their, their communities um, because of the way that the politics in the United States have played out. So really first and foremost, it's about listening to what the people say. Um, it's about foregrounding their knowledge and not trying to like so in academia you always have to like cite different theorists and people that you're talking about and like other people who have written about indigenous scholars or other people who have written about indigenous peoples but if you highlight more of that you're not actually talking about indigenous people right you're talking about people talking about indigenous peoples so it's really about like you know, you have to engage with them. You have to talk with them and say like, I want to talk about these things. Is that okay? And I'm going to ask you these questions. And if you feel uncomfortable answering them, just let me know. And, you know, you have to be willing to sacrifice things that you may find interesting or might make a good article. Um, and you have to sacrifice your own, uh, like my own ego basically to, to not perpetuate those, those, those problematic ways of doing research. Yeah. And I guess like also going, uh, jumping back to like the Univa video, um, or I guess like a lot of them had this idea of like this theme of community being represented through different symbols. And I know that through like some of your work, you were like pointing out um, symbols that artists use um, to, I guess, just like represent different like indigenous themes. Um, and I remember I read about like the flying condor and you said that that reminded of like meditation. So can you just like share with the audience like different symbols um, other than maybe just community or um, different ways that they can like incorporate larger themes through music. Yeah, so um, I think with the condor, I might've mistyped in my uh, paper. I think I was talking about mediation. Um, the condor is often seen as like passing knowledges um, or like a ch at least a, a message being carried. Um, and this is true definitely in, in, in the Andes. And so the song I was talking about in that case was a group in Colombia called Linaje Reginarios but there's a, whole, there's a whole like long story about that. But Condor, El Condor Pasa uh, is, a, is a famous song that a lot of people know. It goes, do, 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 do. A lot of people know it by uh, Simon and Garfunkel, um, but it's an indigenous traditional song for many communities in the, in the Andes. Um, and so that's one way of, you know, these passing on these symbols. Zara Monroy has a, she always wears her like, what is like worn for festivals and like traditional like celebrations. Um, so she always wears those garments when she raps or when she performs. And she also wears like face paint, like traditional face paint that is basically like makeup for them. Um, and so that's another way, like kind of like facial paints and like dress is, an, is, is a big part of it. Um, you could see also like Pat Boy has a bunch of his own like branded shirts and t-shirts and hats and stuff which are like say sangre maya on it which is um maya blood um there's also a really cool one that i don't know if you know the group nwa with attitude um it's an it's a rap group it's probably i guess they're like 20 or 30 years old now um but they had a t-shirt that had like nwa and it said the translation of that and the picture of the of the rapper so now there are artists that have something that says iwa indigenous with attitude and so these are ways that like symbols that speak to many different communities are being used to like unify communities into music while still being specific and talking about, you know, whatever experience. Yeah. And um, I know like our last webinar series, so if the kids have watched like Miss Matsumoto, she's also like studying at Brown and she's working with the Pan Mayan movement. So like linguistic revitalization. And I know that a lot of the communities you're working with are also like from similar regions that she's working with. So the students were like listening about, yeah, like pretty much like revitalizing language. Um, and I guess like this music is like 
like or like the music aspect that you're bringing to the table is something that they can also like understand um and ways to like get involved in terms of like like combining that research like do you think music should be like part of that like revitalization or how can maybe like they work on like incorporating that into their like message as well yeah so like I was saying music is a very important way to connect to people and so is language uh language again language is not just the words that you speak but it's the feelings that come with them it's the it's the communities that you form because of language. Um, and songs that are passed down through through generations as traditional songs often carry knowledge, right? It's you, you, there are songs, songs are often told in the form of stories or stories are often told in the form of songs, especially in indigenous communities. Um, and so to not include those is to actually leave out a vital part of how language works. At least it, for some communities, you know, some communities more than others have have music as a part of it. Um, so, for you know, it, I think it is it is really important to include it. And like Papoy does this really well, where he actually like hosts workshops to write songs with kids to write rap songs. Um, so they're both learning Yucatec Maya, but they're also engaging in like changing the language a bit because you know we don't we don't want to perpetuate the stereotype that there's this this one version of of Yucatec Maya that has to be spoken this way right because languages are always changing they're always growing and adapting and so part of revitalizing giving a new life um, is to give it new life to put languages into different scenarios like rap um, and so I think projects like these while are not like the answer the sole answer to like language revitalization definitely help to help to give them more complex and dynamic view of, of what language is and how it can be how it can be revitalized mm -hmm. yeah and um you mentioned something about like i think towards the beginning of the presentation how like indigenous communities are sometimes like almost fixated in the past where it's like like you're past here's colonization and it's not like i guess like shown in the media but like they can overcome that um and i guess like the representation of like the complexities of identity and like like the fact that like indigenous life is just like vital and like continuing on now. Um, in music, is there like any nuanced ways that like you analyze that like being portrayed or is that also like that idea of like showing community and the different like themes of the, the tribes? Yeah, so this is really interesting. In Rap Originario, which is, so I looked at Rap Originario in Mexico, but it's kind of a, a a global, uh, a, a phenomenon in Latin America. A lot of people are calling what they do rap or Um So in Mexico, it's really a lot about like showing community, showing culture, showing pride for being indigenous. But I was saying before, you know, rap Mapuche and other things in South America often are much more like explicitly critiquing the state. Um, and so, first of all like music can operate in different ways to like show like the complexities of indigenous identity but like in each individual circumstance but then you look at a movement like rap or Hinario, um and you can see that even in these large scale like in these large scale movements there's also a lot of like difference and complexities about like what it even means to be a hip-hop artist um and how that actually affects how people think about being an, an indigenous person um so there's that part of it. And then you get into the lyrics a bit more. Pat Boy Maya Rap had, a, had one of the lyrics I showed was, he said, uh, proudly Maya fighting for each peso. Um, and I asked him what that meant because I was like, I didn't quite understand. And he told me that, well, in, in the system of land ownership that there is now, there's a lot of taxes on, on agriculture, um, especially small scale agriculture. And those are produced by the state, obviously. So like this song that was created and put into like the programming for the state talking about indigenous peoples is actually a critique of the state too. And so there's like, this is, I, I, I see how it's connected to your question about this way of, of representing all of the different complexities and identity and that rap lyrics as something that are 
you know, we know what they mean, but they're also interpretable in different ways by different people. Um, provides a, a kind of one outlet to to for people to understand indigenous identities and identities in general in in their in their complexity. Yeah, and like resistance to the state. Do you think that um, like artists are trying to make that like more like more clearer than not uh, when they're like I guess being incorporated to the state or like under. Um, like the state provided like programs, I guess, for like for cultural preservation. Is it like, is it almost meant to be something that's like blatantly clear that like, oh, we're critiquing the state or do they want it to be nuanced? So it's just like people who like think about the music understand or um, yeah, I guess like have, how have you seen that like playing out in different musics? Yeah, so I, I think at least in the people I were looking at, they wanted their critiques to be more nuanced, at least in the actual songs themselves. But Papoy was very clear that, so there's this term rap originario, which is different than rap indígena. So indigenous versus originary. Indigenous means like to be from a place. So it's about location. Originary is about firstness, about being the first ones there, right? And so like in that subtle nuanced change, there's like this idea of, okay, we're not just from this place, but we are the first people from this place and you are the colonizers. And like that is to me is like a very nuanced critique but a very powerful one um that appears publicly but when i did an interview with him he was like yeah the state in like being the term indigenous is you know is a is a problematic one and like it characterizes people as bad and shameful and that we don't know anything but we do know things and so i call myself originary because of for xyz reasons um and so in mexico at least there's this more nuanced version as I was saying in, in other places, like if you look in the United States, like it's much more explicit. It's much more explicitly anti-state, you know, like the colonizer is awful and we like, we hate the state kind of thing. Well, not necessarily we hate the state, but that's, that's the feeling, right? There's a lot more explicitly directed anger. And so it has to really do with, you know, the politics of the state. Um, because being in it, calling yourself indigenous is always a relationship with the state because it's a category of the state. Um, and so you, you are, I, I have found that in each context I look at, it's, it's slightly different. The amount of nuance, the type of critiques are made are based on the, the relationship, not only between all indigenous peoples and the state that they're in, but specific communities and the specific state as well. Um, so that's like a roundabout way of saying there's all these different <laughs> there's many different ways for this to happen yeah and like the i guess like like the toleration almost of like the states towards like this resistance like do you think um if if it was more explicit like maybe like the state would react differently because like sometimes i read the stuff that professors are publishing in like the united states and i'm like like for a university that's like built on like stolen land they're just like pretty brave for just like saying all this stuff and the university is like hosting all of this research so I don't, I've like thought about like why are they almost like or how are they tolerant without like being kicked out for the stuff that they're doing if that makes sense like they're allowing people to like bring more knowledge about the stuff that they're done but aren't really like changing stuff so I know that at least like in the United States that seems to be like a big problem but like maybe in Mexico are there is there like a different way that like the state is handling it or almost not like taking the blame for what like people are bringing light to nowadays yeah um i th well i think that hmm. i'm mean, gonna do i guess i'll do a more a little, a little more comparison right so the rap mapuche which i keep talking about in south america and chile and argentina there are they one of the producers I, I was talking with said that those artists tend to get a lot less coverage and a lot are a lot less like are not really incorporated into the state. Like they're not invited to talk at events or like perform at state sanctioned events. Um, and so there is a way that, that, that the state wants to talk about praising indigenous peoples and not talk about critiquing the state. Um, and so if you're just explicitly critical, then often that message gets ignored. But if you do, if you do this more nuanced performance, it's like, the state will, it seems like the state will allow it, you know, it seems like the, it's a, it's an okay thing. And, you know, who knows, they, the state might not even be aware that these are the critiques. Like, I didn't know that that line of Pat Boys was a critique until I asked him. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so that also provides a problem, like right? Like, okay, are people actually seeing the the subtle nuanced critiques or are they just like, oh yay, more indigenous hip hop. This is cool. Like, I love this. And like, is it more, is it, does it just continue the same issue? Um, yeah, it's, it's really complicated. And like your, your analogy with the, with the academy is a, uh, is a pertinent one because the academy likes to think, well, I mean, I'm going to be very critical right here, but the academy likes to think that it's doing a lot of good work and often it's just an echo chamber. Um, and it's really easy to write a book that only a hundred people will read and say a lot of critical things. And it's a lot harder to say those things on a national stage and also be included. Um, and so it's, there's a balance you have to find of like providing maybe critique that is helpful, maybe providing, you know, critique that is not explicitly seeking to destroy the thing, um, but still somehow having to have those messages underneath. Um, yeah, it's complicated. I don't, there's no, there's no one answer and it, it's difficult to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also, I also feel like if the message was like blatantly clear, then that idea of like co-option that you were talking about, how like media structures could just almost like, yeah, like take like artists work. Um, can you provide any examples maybe of like this happening, like the idea of co-option? I, I feel like maybe in the context of like globalization or capitalization off of the art. Yeah, so this, I have the perfect example. This year in Mexico, there's this thing called Contigo en la Distancia, Together in the Distance. And this was a, a series of concerts and online events for, for people to connect over COVID, right? So it is like cultura desde casa, culture from home. And so there was, as I said, like streams and concerts and events, but there was also like access to books and artwork and literature and like museums and stuff all, all online. Um, and as part of this indigenous peoples, like Zara Monroy was super heavily featured. She performed at a number of concerts and a number of different events. Um, and so there is this, you know, her image basically, right? There's like, I, I like to see it as two different things, right? There's like Zara Monroy, the person, and then there's Zara Monroy, her like indigenous rapper persona, right? And she has many different like identities that go along with the different practices she she does, um, whether it's dancing or hip hop or like poetry. But one thing that I think is good about music is that it allows for something that can be co-optable, like an image of a person or like the idea of an indigenous rapper, while not completely taking everything that is about them, if, if that makes sense, right? So like indigenous artists can create an identity, like a, a, a hip hop persona that is meant to be co-opted and by the state, right? Because, you, you know, the state is an oppressive regime. It always has been and always will be an oppressive regime. That's my personal view. And I think that's a view that a lot of people hold, but nonetheless, it is a reality that we live in. And to some degree, you have to be incorporated in that if you want to like affect major changes, right? You can completely reject it, but you're not going to get you're not going to get that much popularity. You're not going to go very far unless, you know, everyone starts to starts to reject the state at once. Um, and so, again, it's complicated. But I think that the idea of co-option by, by like by media or by the state can be repurposed by indigenous peoples in, because of music and because of hip hop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think some questions that like Calvin had, I think most of them, like you've already answered, but I think one of them that could hopefully like just tie this back down is um, in terms of like opportunities for like students to get involved in, like more of like the audience would be like high school students. Um, I'll like definitely share around like the Instagram, um, like accounts that you gave us, but um, following them, like listening to more music, um, like like practicing maybe languages, like learning from Pat Boy um, are all like suggestions. Do you have anything else you'd like to add to the list for me to like send out a like set of resources for them? Hmm. I mean, so if you, I would say that the most important thing right now, at least like in, in, in this kind of moment of not being able to actually go anywhere or do anything, um, follow them you can you can do a number of different like activist techniques on, on on instagram for example if you if you um add a post to your collection that 
it holds a higher place in the algorithm than a like, than a comment, which holds a higher place than a like, which holds a higher place than a follow. Or there, there's an there's an order, so you can like I can maybe find I can maybe find that um the post I'm talking about, which explains that. But you can do those things, which will help get their message further. But also look at what they post. They often have like different like um like Pat Boy's building recording studio and so he's selling masks that are made by people in his community as a way to raise money for that. Zara Monroy often has these um you know just like fundraisers to the to raise money for like protective and sanitary equipment. Um and so you know there's these different like you know fundraising techniques that are often used by indigenous artists. And so if you follow them and like donate to those, that is that is one possible way. Learning languages um also you know many people critique this idea but just having conversations with people and if there's something that is that you find to be problematic raising that issue in a way that really gets to the person not trying to be like no don't say this don't say that you <laughs> you suck you can't say this or you're being problematic being like oh the things i've seen about x community or x type of person say this like what do you think about that and while that can't be the only thing that we do that is that is still a necessary and, and important part of it mm -hmm. yeah, yeah um so thank you so much for coming i'll stop